1992, that song blew my life up. Donald Miller, in his book Storyline, asked, if your life was made into a movie, what would be on that poster? What would it say? Would it say you were trying to pay down your mortgage? Would it say you were trying to buy a bigger TV? Would it say, I just want to golf more? Would it say, I'm just trying to retire comfortably? Make more money. What if a guy's whole life is about buying a Volvo and nothing personal, Kent? I'm not picking on you, but, <laughs> but. And at the end of the movie, he gets the car. And not very inspirational, right? <laughs> and say, let's go even further. I, I, I just want to be married. Th that's a good thing, but it's not enough. There's got to be more. What I love about the scripture as I read it, and everybody reads it with a different lens, right? Somebody, you know, we all kind of come to the table with a different look. When we, come, when we come to reading scripture, we have our own biases or we have our own bent, our own personalities. It's, it's a lot of things that go into that. But one of the things I am confident of is I read scripture as if we're something of a noble tribe. We just are. Scripture tells us that we're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, built to run. But for many of us, we get up each day just trying to figure out how to get through that day. And then tomorrow shows up and we try to figure out how to get through that day. What if you looked at each day as an adventure? That each day has purpose. That each day matters. That each day has a calling on my life and everything that I do and everything that I say and everywhere that I go, there is a purpose. Ephesians 3, 22, 21, I, told, I read to you earlier. Not to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. According to his power, power that is at where? At work where? In you. Needs to be in you. Can't just be around you. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And amen. One of the things about all generations, we believe here in intergenerational. One of the reasons we do dinner on the ground is to connect the generations. It's very purposeful as part of that. But I love what Craig Groeschel says. Coming out of this passage of Scripture, he says, your brain cannot comprehend what your God is capable of doing through you. Your brain, your brain will shut you down. If you only depend on your brain and, and all that's been given to you up to this point, your brain cannot comprehend what God, your God can do through you. One of the biggest game changer moments, and you know we define game changer is a time stops, life altering, you'll never be the same again kind of moment, a game changer moment. But one of the greatest game changer moments for me was when I realized in my life that not only now, but moving forward, this whole salvation deal wasn't just what God had saved me from, it's what he, God had saved me for. Let me say that again, because some of you need to hear this. Some of you are just more concerned about what God saved you from. That's great, and that is true, and you need that. But God has saved you for something. You've got a great purpose. All things are new. You're created new creation. Old things are gone. All things are new. You're created for something. There is no cap on it. There is no age expiration. There is nothing. You know, here we preach about the spirit of Caleb, where Caleb at 85 years old was still saying, give me my mountain. I got the same vigor as I had 40 years ago when you stuck me with these knuckleheads. I have still got it. Give me those mountains. And I don't just want, don't, I don't want just any land. I want the land where the giants are, the giants that kept us out in the first place. I want them first. 
there is no time you don't go, well, I reached this point, now I can coast. I don't see that in Scripture. Matter, matter of fact, the Jewish tradition, there was no retirement that I can tell. And we just made that up here so we can change the workforce over a little bit. And we're living longer. That should be an advantage. One of the things I talked to you about is, and kind of recap a little bit, one, a couple of things, and I won't recap the whole sermon series, but one of the things this last week was learning how to move or to hear when God doesn't give you a direct command in Scripture where you can't just look it up and go, I know the answer to that one. But what about when God just, just doesn't give you that direct answer? Anybody ever been there? We just go, I don't know. I can't find it right there, but I know there's a lot of things going on. I know God's moving. I just can't find an exact answer. Move here and, you know, move to Arizona January 1st, 1998. I, I can't find that in here. But we begin to listen for his voice. The word says we will know his voice. But we also begin to look at circumstances. We begin to listen to people who are wise around us. But we're also in the word. We understand the character of God. Sometimes he asks us to be still. Sometimes he calls us to start something. Sometimes he tells us to stop something. Anybody ever been there? Stop doing that. It's not good for you, but sometimes it's stop doing that, not because it's immoral. It's just time for you to stop doing that. I think it's John Acuff calls it the quitter list. Sometimes you just need to quit doing things that have kind of outlived their time. Church in America, at times we need to do that. But sometimes he tells us to start. Good advice here, I think, when you know he's told you to start, you need to start. I mean, when I left Crossroads seven years ago now, almost eight years ago, Jan and I knew for six years before that we were going to leave. But what I learned in that six years was be faithful where you are. Submit to where you are. Be faithful there. I don't know where there is for you right now, but what I can guarantee you is he's calling you to be faithful. If he's told you to stay, then you stay and be faithful. But when you hear him say go, I'm just going to tell you, you need to figure out how to go. And some of you in here today going, I, I, I don't know what I'm hearing. As I said last week, you know, one of my daughters, my oldest daughter knew when she was 15 what she was called to do. Uh, the, the next one in the line, and then, and of course, Tori and Colton, but Allie didn't know since she was 28 or 29. But what changed was, and I hope it's for all of them, even if you don't know, if you will do this, if you will just tell God, I will be obedient and abandoned. Remember, we defined abandon last week, it's all yours. This whole thing is yours, and I really can trust you, God. I've really come to the place where I believe that I could, if I abandon everything or consecrate everything to you, I can trust you. So if you're walking with an obedient and abandoned heart, I can guarantee you God's going to show you. You're going to know. You're just going to know. So don't freak out too much that you don't know all of it right now. Just be obedient and abandoned. I got a question for all of us here this morning, including myself. How many of you would say today that if you understood what God was telling you to do or telling me to do, let's say it, make it personal. If he was telling, and you said to yourself, if God was telling me to do something and I understood it, no matter what it would be, I would do everything I can to try to live into it. Let me say it again. If God showed you right now, from the most radical to the most simple, if he showed you right now and you understood it and you saw his face and you understood it, would you do it?
For instance, some of you, through circumstances, God has gotten your undivided attention. He has absolutely got your undivided attention. My advice to you is to listen to it. But I can't make you or force you, and nobody else can either. I know when my call to students and to preach to students, I didn't know I was called to go to students. I, I just knew I'd been called to preach. I didn't know if I'd ever be a full-time pastor. I never even thought I'd be necessarily on staff anywhere. But somebody asked me to go help with students. There were about 20 to 30 kids, 25 to 30 kids or whatever it was. And then, and then before I know it, God continued to stir something and awaken. Then they asked me to do a, 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 a retreat which lined up with my calling and my gift mix, but I didn't know what else was, that makes sense. I didn't know what the other part was. But then I continued to follow and continue to expose myself and continue to go, God, whatever you're saying, before I know it, I'm the youth pastor. And it's almost like that. It's almost like, well, how did I get here? And if you look back at it, it almost seems impossible that God did that. But, but I've come to the conclusion it's supposed to seem impossible if God's in it. Because when I look at Scripture, I don't see many times in Scripture when God calls somebody, and I know they don't necessarily say this, but I'm going to guess they didn't think, well, that'll be easy. Uh, Moses, I'm calling you to take those people. Oh, well, that'll be easy. Timothy, that we're talking, we're going to talk about just a minute. Timothy, you're going to be the bishop of Ephesus. I'm sure in the middle of all that, he's going, well, that'll be easy. No, it's supposed to be impossible because in this sense that it leaves room for God. Right now, you go, how could I get out of the circuit? How could God, the place I'm in, how could God? Well, you fill in the blank. One of my most impossible is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We all probably know it, or most of us in here know it if you've been in church any time. But Jesus is saying to the disciples, says, all of the authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And I'm sure they said, well, that's easy. Well, that was easy. He doesn't even give them a plan. Right? There's no plan. Some of you go, well, y'all don't have a very good discipleship. Well, Jesus didn't give us a plan. We're just trying to figure it out. He did not give us a plan. He expects us to seek his face. He expects us to go understand the cultural context we're in. He expects us to be able to, obviously coming out of the word, we need to know who Jesus is. Like I said last week, the greatest thing you can do is following Jesus is figure out who Jesus is. And then do what he says. That's your first step. Acts 1.8. Jesus didn't leave him alone. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. To be my witnesses. Literally there means what? Martyr. To be my martyr. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I'm sure they all said what? That'll be easy. No, they were, Jesus ascended, and they're sitting there looking up at the sky going, what just happened? impossible guarantees our reliance it guarantees our obedience it guarantees that we step into it and also guarantees he will get the glory and he will get the praise and it won't be coming back to you but i believe this with all my heart 
Some of you are here today going, oh, you mean I'm supposed to go into all the world? I tell you where you start, start in your home. God can do a miracle in your marriage. God can do a miracle in, it's supposed to be impossible. Try to have a marriage, when we'll talk about it more next week, try to have a marriage where neither one of the participants are self-centered. Without the presence and the power, it's not possible. Do you want to have a marriage that's just like, wow, people are attracted, there's a fragrance and aroma of your marriage, then it better be with the presence and the power. You want to raise kids? There were all three moral agents, and those kids can decide what they want to do. I get all that, but I'll tell you what, the first thing is I've got to make some decisions in my home of how I'm going to live. Jan and I have to make decisions of how we're going to act and how we're going to live. First Timothy 4, 12 through 16, you go, I thought you were preaching out of Timothy. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. I love this. If I, I, if I could preach two messages and only two messages the rest of my life in forms, at least around the context, it would be this Sunday and next Sunday. If I had two sermons that I was told, these are the two you can preach, and this is the only two you can preach, you've got to pick them, it would be this Sunday and it would be next Sunday. And I'm not even sure what next Sunday is yet, but I know I'm going to really like it. No, I, I do. I kind of do. The reason why I believe God camped me out sitting on a patio up in Washington this summer or on a, a, a porch. Because I think this passage of Scripture just, just is, is what I want people to hear about this whole journey. And it's this. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And again, we've preached on that. But set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to leading. Again, again, teaching. Let me make sure again that you know uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. Okay, I just want to make sure you knew that. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy here. He says, do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid hands on you. Be diligent. Last week we talked about this. Be diligent. In other words, set a plan. Devise a plan. You've got, if, you, if the course has been set before you, you need to devise a plan. In other words, be diligent. Devise a plan in these matters. In other words, everything I just talked about in these matters. Give yourself Holy literally means like a sponge absorbing as much as you can. Give yourself wholly absorbed by this. It's not just like a little off shot. It's not like just a good option on, like you'd buy an option on a car. It's a good thing to have. You're absorbed by this. So that everyone may see your progress. Oh, I love that. We've preached these four weeks just for me to get that one line right there. No, not really. And as I studied this passage of Scripture, the word progress there, are, and I'm going to butcher this. I, like I've told you before, I don't even speak English well, so the Greek is really hard. But prokope is the word here. It means to advance. But it's not just merely moving ahead, but doing so against obstacles. It's like an explorer or an advance team hacking a path. And all I could think of was my machete when I was reading this this summer, last summer. I mean, hacking a path where there was no path, you begin to advance. And let me make sure it's screwed on good before I keep swinging that thing around. Okay, this machete, those who are listening online, uh, machete. Uh, but you're advancing. You can see it. You can see cutting through because you're doing We talk about it a lot here. The point man or the walk-in-front leader. He who walks in front walks closest where? 
to death, okay? <laughs> because what's behind you is more important. You know that you're protecting and you're advancing for what's behind you. So you're willing to walk in front, men and women. So don't take this young and old and everything in between. The Procop, let them see your advancement. Let them see where you're cutting through all the mess. Let them see, yeah, there's obstacles. Sure there are, because anybody has a reason to what? Quit. Everybody has a reason to quit. Everybody has obstacles. Last week, I, it's kind of funny, I didn't have very many people last week, but I had a dear friend of mine, and she knows who she is. I'm going to pick at her a little bit. I won't even say her name right now. But I knew my shirt was too short last week. I knew it. I came in here, but this is the only shirt I had. But it was an obstacle of me preaching last week. Because every time, and then she told me afterwards, I saw your belly button. You need to get a longer shirt. I agree. I agree. I already knew it. Didn't have to tell me. I already knew it. It was an obstacle. You don't think it's not rolling around in your mind as you're up here? You're going, what are you thinking about up there? That's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about as I'm talking to you. Just so you know. Just so you know. That's a minor obstacle in what we face all the time. Let them see your progress. Let them see how you're absorbed by this calling. Let them see that you've saddled up your horses and you got a trail to blaze. In the wild blue yonder, in God's amazing grace. One of the reasons I, I was speaking, my, my sister-in-law's uh, memorial a few weeks ago, and as I was studying and talking about how you run the race and this great cloud of witnesses that's watching us and in the scriptures I was reading it talking about the fact that it won't even be complete. Heaven won't be complete till we all get there. Isn't that an awesome thing? Until you get there, it's not complete. They're waiting on us too. This is an awesome picture, I think, when I begin to think about heaven. But as I was preparing for that, I've read this of the NIV, and I think I may have along the way memorized not the wrong version, but the tame version of that passage of Scripture, that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. How many of you know that? You've heard that. You've memorized it. But I love it when I was reading the NIV. And let me read both verses 1 and 2 here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. We talked about it last week. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You know when I thought of on that? The author? Do you know people write books on things that they've never done themselves? Did you know that? They've never done it themselves. People write about baseball, sports. They write about all kinds of things, and they're pretty well authority on them, but it doesn't mean they've done it. So when that, literally that phrase there, with the translation, author gets you kind of down the road, but it doesn't mean it. It literally means a pioneer who starts a movement and then continues the movement. He's advancing. Scorning the what? Shame. He went to the cross and took all that. But he has called us now, cleared the way for us to progress. Procope. How do we get somewhere along the way that we're not required to do that? We're not asked to do that. We are to be transformed into his likeness. Scripture tells us over and over, where did we get it where it's okay to stay right here? I'm not going to cut Jeff's head off, just so you know. What would this be called? What, what kind of figurine is this? It's an action figure, right? An action figure. 
See, I, I don't bet those who grew up in the 60s and 70s like I did, G.I. Joe was a big, anybody know? G. What about Johnny West? Anybody have a Johnny West? Yeah, Johnny West, Geronimo. Those, 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 I didn't have a Ken. No, no, Ken's a pretty boy. And Ken's a doll. Okay, these guys are what? Action figures. Right? But you know what? If I laid, Ken, if I laid Jeff down there, and Jack, Jeff, the reason why I like Jeff, because he drives 180, 190 miles an hour. I like Jeff. Of course, he doesn't do it anymore, but he did. He's got some cool hair, too, if you look at it real close. They did a great job on it. But the thing is, I could lay Jeff Gordon action figure doll down right there and come back five years later, he's still there. There ain't no action at all. I'm going to break somebody's heart here, and I'm going to blow your mind. Tori's story is not based on true stories. They don't come to life after we've all, I know you're going, Kurt, you don't know. Are you there? No. Does the tree fall in the forest? Is it really, you know, okay, then the, I get it. Toy Story is not true. Those action figures that come to life, well, in the real life, is these action figures, five, put them in a storage because I just did it and got it out the other day on Colton's birthday. He's still in the same place, right there next to Travis Pastrano. <laughs> No, what a different story there. Why are they called action figures? Because unless we're involved in it, there is no action. This is a book of action. Read about them. This is a book of action. But guess what? You can lay it right there and come back five years later, and there's nothing changed in your life because you've not taken it and done something with it. What do you expect with what you've invested? What do you expect with what you've done with it? What do you expect? My notes are in here. I got to go, pick it back up real quick. <laughs> Just for your sake, I need to stay on them, okay? When we look at the church in America, for the most part, talking to somebody the other day, if you're maintaining, it's what we would used to be going, called growing. Now, there's a lot of people moving stations from place to place, obviously. And some churches are growing, hopefully, by baptism, and those, I mean, that's true. But overall, the church in America is not thought as the church in action. George Barna, I've shared with, with you many times, and I can share with you again, probably may mention it next week or whatever. But it's crazy when you begin to look at these stats of 10-step journey of ignorance or concept of existence and sin, which is, you know, most of us know the term. But when you start looking at number five and number six, it kind of begins to make you sick a little bit because we've got church in America committed to faith activities, but not necessarily committed to Christ. And you begin this prolonged spiritual discontent. In other words, God begins to stir something in you and says, I can't stay where I am right now. Something's different than it used to be. I've got to move. And then when you get all the way down to it, when you look at, because we know this, and Wesley defined it this way, but, you know, what is holiness? It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And then when you look up here, and if Barna is correct, 9 and 10 is that. One percent. Barnes says we filled the churches with a lot of Christ admirers, but not Christ followers. A lot of Christ admirers, but not a lot of Christ followers. 
Many of you know here we use something called the five C's, or we're working on, been working on it for a few years, and uh, we believe everybody comes in in one of these places. Everybody's always in one of these five, and you can argue with it. That's fine. You can come up with your own five C's, okay? But these are, these are what we're working on. Again, because of what? Jesus didn't give us a real plan in Matthew 28. <laughs> he just said, go and make. So we're trying to make, and we're trying to figure out how to do it in a cultural context. But again, most people we know back to Barna's, don't go back to Barna's slide, but referring to Barna's slide, is that most people, um, uh, a lot of people operate just in conscience, where they're ignorant of God, not, not stupid, they're just ignorant of what he can do. They're indifferent to God, which I lived for a decade. I tried to get indifferent. I got indifferent by hardening my heart. You can get there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You can become indifferent to God moving on your life because, because you've hardened your heart and you're not going to move. You're not going to be obedient. Or you could become combative. You use the term, well, if you're a Christian or anything about Christ, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what. If God would let this to happen, let me just, so you attack the messenger. Not even the message. You're going to attack the, I'm not even going to talk about Jesus. You're just going to attack the messenger. But combative. The next one is, and there's some transitions I'm not going to get into today. But the next one is concerned. You get awakened and go, is this true? Is it true for me? And is it true for me all the time? It's not a conditional grace. And then you make that transition to salvation where you're convinced. Those who are people I believe are number five and number six. The people who are convinced, they're back to Romans 10 that we talked about last week. That they declare with their mouth and believe in their heart. Declare meaning that I, I agree with you, God. And I'm saying it, and with my heart, I'm going to move you into decision-making. But the problem is, we move into that. If we stay there too long, we get stuck, so we get comfortable. We all should be secure in our faith. We should be comfortable in our faith, but then we become complacent. It's kind of like saying you get married, and uh, the complacent is this. I get married, and I say to Jan, I'm never going to divorce you. That's the end of it. Nothing else, no action, and no doing things to give myself away and become less and less self-centered so I can pour my life into her and to pour my, no, 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 just I'm never going to get a divorce, so we just stay with that. I'm complacent, it's okay, I take you for granted, I'm just never going to leave you, just, then the last one is capped, we're just capped. And we can be capped there for a lot of different reasons, from habitual sins to control, being a control freak to unforgiveness to regret. But I said last week, you know, it's one thing to, re I, did, well, I didn't say this part, but I said this from Seth Godin. It's one thing to regret yesterday. It's another thing to already be regretting tomorrow. Tomorrow's, tomorrow comes daily, but you don't have to take the same route, the same route to get there. Yeah, you can regret. I get all that. And what shame? Jesus says, I scorn shame. The reason why shame, shame's different than guilt, right? Shame is that's, who, that's what you did and that's who you are and you'll always be that. Guilt is, hey, yeah, that's what happened. Wake up. Conviction. Wake up. There's a hope. Repent. Let's go. Let's get up and go. Some of us have a sin hierarchy, that my sin's not as bad as somebody else's. Let me say this. I realize there's a ripple effect difference between two married people committing adultery and the ripples of that and some man looking at pornography in that moment. They are different in the ripples potentially, but the sin is sin. Please hear me. Like I said last week, you, you can pick somebody else up part because they're too high energy or they're trying too many things or they're doing this or that. But also you need to look at yourself and go, okay, maybe, just maybe, me not getting myself to the point where God can work through me, that's a sin too because you took a talent and you hid it. And I can do a whole sermon series on those. You took something God has given you, this wonderful life, and you just put it aside and you hid it. And didn't try to take, you didn't invest it. The last thing I'll just mention here is fear. Fear. People get capped because of fear. 
And it doesn't matter where you, let me say this about fear, and I appreciate Jeff, I know he's working with the children now, but I appreciate Jeff talking about fear a while ago, because fear, I, I love, the other day I sent Allie a, a, a text based, or an email, a text the other day based on this, but fear can grab, Allie had an opportunity to speak at Southern Nazarene University at Chapel in front of a thousand people, she never spoke in front of a thousand people, she did that Thursday morning in, at, at Bethany, Oklahoma. But she had fear and anxiety Wednesday afternoon. Unbelievable fear and anxiety about what she was about to step off into. So we talked her off the ledge a little bit. <laughs> then you just have to be reminded of what God has done already. And you're going, I've been in bigger things than this. They can't eat you. <laughs> Worst they can do is go, nice talk, lady, and walk out. I get used to that every week. Nice talk, dude. I'm gone. <laughs> you just have to, that's part of it. But I love this Donald, so I, this Donald Miller, and I gave her the last line. I sent her this last line. I love Donald Miller's quote here. And he says, the most often repeated commandment in the Bible is do not fear. It is then in there over 200 times. That means a couple of things. If you think about it, if you think about it, it means we are going to be afraid, and it means we shouldn't let fear boss us around. Before I realized it, I, we were supposed. Before I realized we were supposed to fight fear, I thought of fear as a subtle, subtle suggestion in our subconscious, designed to keep us safe, or more important, keep us from getting humiliated. And I guess it serves that purpose, but fear only isn't a guide to keep us safe. It's also a manipulative emotion that can trick us into living a boring life. Saddle up your horses. If you're waiting for fear to be gone, you won't move. But courage is this fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the absence of self. There's something more important. The call of God on my life and the people I may affect, that is more important than the fear. Yes, it's impossible without the presence. But he promises you shall receive power to be my witnesses. Power there, the dunamis power, literally means dynamite power. You will receive that. I've watched churches over the years just play it safe. I mean, I've personally been involved where it's more, more important about the degree and education and some level of, 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 of uh experience versus hunger and humble if you will and gifted and rough edges and that's all true okay but i'm telling you right now just if you just if you just box it in you're in trouble because what you get there is safe you may not get future but you may get safe some of you are looking for safe instead of future You know, we talk about the ladder here, and we use it, and God, I, I believe, you know, if you come to the ladder and just, I know we're running late. Okay, here we go. I'm a firm believer that God is always trying to stretch us. He's always taking us somewhere new. And like I've said before, on the, I think it's Billy Graham says, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It doesn't matter Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter what color doesn't matter what gender we all come to the cross at the same place there is no caste system here but god lets us get good and sturdy and then he goes and all god's rungs on his ladder are a stretch They're like three feet apart <laughs> i don't know what your stretch is but and he lets us ah, then he gets us there and i believe he does this he lets us get steady and when you know you're steady you better get ready because God is going to do it again. And he's going to keep taking you. He's gonna, some of you are looking for an open door for God to do something, and it's on the eighth rung, and you're not willing to move from the second one. That's why you've never seen it. That's why you've never walked through that door. You're wanting something for your marriage. But the problem is you're not willing to let go of things. The biggest issue for churches or people is not willing to let go of things that they think are important. And God says you've got to let go of that. 
You're not willing to move forward. So you're stuck and you're capped. So I want to live where? Here. I'm just not going to do it in front of you. Okay. <laughs> just believe later. That's what happens when I'm in here by myself. I stand on it. Kind of like Woody or, or Buzz Lightyear. Okay, I come alive. Every rung with God says this. Every rung with God is not simple. Every rung with God is going to say, don't do that, everybody, because your brain cannot comprehend what your God can do through you. And we'll talk more about this next week. About the convicted and the compelled. But let me say this, friend. You can think comfort or you can take courage. You can think comfort or you can think courage, but you can't do both. You just can't do both. You can make progress or you can make excuses, but what? You can't do both. You can't do both. God has called us to this great adventure. God has called us to this unbelievable life. And sure, but like I said earlier, I don't know what I did with my weapon, but you know, many of you know when I preached on the watchman many years ago and we came about Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah, we came to the conclusion is that God gives us a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. He's going to give you something to do and he's going to give you something to fight with because that's what Nehemiah ended up doing. He gave him a weapon and he gave him, he gave him a weapon and he gave him a tool. I don't know what you want. But you've ended up with me as your pastor, and I apologize to some of you if that's happened to you. But you know my quote from Tom Landry, which many of you are big Tom Landry fans in here. I know that. And it's about being a coach. A coach is someone who tells you what you don't want to hear, who has you see what you don't want to see so you can be who you've always known you could be. That's what you've ended up with. And I realize it's not for everybody. And these five C's, we'll talk about compel, convicted and compelled next week. You need to be hanging out with people who are convicted and compelled. But some of you may get a misunderstanding about even the compelled person. You think, because I sometimes talk about that's the SEAL Team 6 end of this thing. But please hear me. Timothy is mentioned because he's having a letter written to him. Not because he's necessarily writing the letter. Paul is who we know about. Paul is who we, but Timothy was critical. Timothy was living where all these idols, he was a, you don't know much about him. I'm sure he was probably a whole different guy than Paul was. Whole different gift mix, maybe. You may not know this, he died. They killed him. The best, the best I understand was he went out, he came back from Rome. He came back from Rome and, and visiting Paul, and they're having this ridiculous parade uh, of, of celebration of these ridiculous idols and masks on and all this kind of stuff. And he went out and started challenging their ridiculous idols, and guess what they did? They beat him to death. That's what it costs you sometimes. I'm not saying it's going to cost any of you that. See, we've got something here. The gospel. The good news. Amen? The good news. And this good news is more than just getting you to heaven. This is good news right now. This starts you on a whole different adventure. This starts you on a whole different path. That you didn't even know existed. You did not know, like I said, I butchered the language, I know. You didn't even know existed until you abandoned, until you're obedient. People get capped. We're going to talk more about the convicted and the compelled next week. I want to hang out with those people. It's really why it's going to be important who you hang out with. And like I said last week, I'll minister to anyone. But I choose my influencers very, very carefully.
They made a movie about your life. Ought to be on the poster. I would be on the poster that said, oh, I don't want to go see that movie. I would be the trailer going, man, I want to go see that movie. And please hear me. I'm not saying you're going to be out there charging hell with a water pistol. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you may choose that I'm going to raise up godly young men and women do everything. That is my call. There is no greater call. Please do not misunderstand. When I talk about the compelled next week, I don't know if I mentioned him or not, there's a guy named Jack Coocher in North Little Rock. Though, or used to be, now he's moved back to where his daughter is. But if you knew Jack, he was the most unassuming in the sense of he is the most humble, most behind the scenes, but I would could put him right in the compelled because of what he does and what he does every day for the kingdom. So we don't all look alike. So please don't walk out of here today going, oh, they got to look like that. But we're all called to make progress. We're all called to take up, I believe, our weapon and our tools. Our tools, the gifts, and the stories, and the personalities, and all the things that God has given us. We can't bury those. Scripture doesn't, it doesn't end well for them. Tool in one hand, and a weapon in the other. And let's go. Saddle up your horse. Would you stand with me? Josiah, why don't you come down and just play something? No, I don't play anything. We're good. And by the way, Jeff hasn't moved since we since I laid him down there. Lord, help us become the people you've called us to be. We love you, Lord. We pray this week will be an uncommon week, a week that if somehow, some way, not in the sense of of, hey, look at this heroic thing I went and did, and it was in the newspaper on the news. But this week, I began to love my wife the way that you would. I began to love my husband the way that you would. I began to, 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 to lead my home the way that you would. I began to show up at work differently because I'm going there the way you would. This week, if there was anything written about to put on the poster of my life, this week would be a part of it because this week I'm going to do the best I can, Lord, to live into all that you've called me to live into. Lord, we love you and thank you for this chance to be together today, Lord, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Go have an uncommon week in his name.